The kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, Lo, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. Also translated, within you. This has been picked up by the monastic centuries, especially in the East. We are feasting on this day a character who is important in the spirituality of the East and of the West, actually, because he was aware of certain truths that we also need to recuperate. The saint of this day, Josaphat, was born into an Eastern Orthodox family in the area of Ukraine. But he was aware of the importance of unity, of the See of Peter as a centre of unity, but also of the importance of his own heritage. And he combined the two in working for reconciliation and the use of the best of both. And in that, the monastic life was a key, and it still is. Why? It transcends certain things when lived intensely. Stillness opens the soul to all the realms of the beyond, for it is no longer emitting but ingesting and listening and accepting. It's not in output mode but profound input, and that makes it aware of things that the noisy soul with difficulty becomes aware of. It's interesting that in our own time that has been perceived by many Christians. The phenomenon of Thézé, which was born after the war in a Protestant ambit, became a centre of radiation and healing on many levels. Beauty has come forth from there and great awareness, and many Christians have drifted there and found blessing. It became an interesting place of encounter of spiritualities. Largely because it wasn't orientated towards proclaiming specific dogmas, but to encounter. Encounter with God in beauty created, and in there encounter with other souls, respected in their diversity. One thing that actually we have in the Catholic world specifically is that universality. The Eastern Orthodox churches have a certain sharing, kinonia, but they do have a tendency to be aware of their local church, their national church. They are quite nationalistic, whereas we just go to a Catholic church and we're straight at home immediately, wherever it may be. When this Saint Josephat was raised to the altar. Pope Benedict XV had beautiful words to say. In his labours to restore unity, it was surely a holy instinct that led him to realise how much good he could effect by retaining within the universal church the use of the Slavonic rite and St. Basil's rule of the monastic life. He was principally exercised over the union of his own countrymen with the See of Peter. We notice that the East, they can't have a ecumenical council as such, because Peter is not there. He searched everywhere for means to forward and strengthen that unity, particularly by issuing liturgical books. Notice the centrality of the liturgy. Great point of encounter which had been in use in the Eastern Church, and even among dissident Christians, in accordance with the norms of the Fathers. After these very careful preliminaries, 
he began the actual business of unification. He acted with a force and a persuasiveness and with such a success that he was called by his very adversaries the snatcher of souls. Would that the church had many such snatchers of souls. And that is also something that Christians share right across the board. When I was young, I had the privilege with two Christian friends of going to listen to Nicky Cruz in the Sophia Gardens in Cardiff, in the pavilion there. And he gave his testimony how Reverend David Wilkerson actually conquered his soul. It's quite interesting, and it came through in the book The Cross, the Cross and the Switchblade, which has since become a film with Pat Boone starring as Nicky Cruz. No, as David Wilkerson, the good evangelical pastor who wouldn't let go of just one soul. Knowing that if he got this soul, he'd get the whole gang. And he got it against all odds. That is how much a soul costs. The Lord would have died just for one. And so we do well to bear in mind these issues. This element of the soul, not to expend all our internal energy on issues which can obfuscate and make opaque the real issue, salvation and the glory of God. Now, therefore, with regard to the monastic life, it's something that favours that hugely. We've noticed that in England, which then had an influence on America, as a result of the Oxford movement, there was a reverse of monasticism in the Anglican Communion. It's still there. There are one or two interesting experiments, some which became Catholic. When I was a student, I visited the big monastery of St Mary the Virgin and Wantage, a very Anglican, high Anglican place. We were there actually, but this time of year it was all saints, that period, and very beautiful liturgy, very Catholic. But the whole community eventually became Catholic, Roman Catholic, and had to leave that beautiful monastery. They now housed in a more simple place, but there, aware of what they have, because they didn't have the sacraments, they became aware of that. And actually their chaplain became a friend of mine, I used to call him Daddy Allen, Father Derek Allen, a great guide of souls, and a man of God. They have authentic prayer, therefore. And the awareness of that spread, strangely enough, even as far as the more free churches, like the Baptists, Methodists and Presbyterians, because they do respect something of that. And the proof is that one sees them going to places like Cordy Island, which is a Catholic monastery, an island there where the Catholic monks actually are at it from a long time, praying. It goes back to Celtic times, and therefore, because it goes back to Celtic times, it goes back to the period of St. David and company. And therefore, they are, as it were, at home, because that's part of their heritage. So it's interesting that having St. David in a very Protestant country as the patron saint, it works perfectly well because it's kind of neutral. And that's where we meet the creation of stillness and beauty, spaces where heaven and earth can meet, and we need them. What has happened here in this hermitage could have happened actually elsewhere. A lot depends on local bishops. I just noticed how having a bishop who was very open-minded took it on, whereas other bishops didn't. Whereas I often feel, if graces are repelled, it's a pity. Because had there been an oasis of peace in the heart of the Welsh Wales, for instance, all that beauty common to all could have been harnessed, and the stillness could have been a great healer of divisions. That we need, and not more infighting, either between Christians or among our own. Too much energy is being expended in firing missiles through the cybersphere. The Eastern monastic life is very calm. They haven't had councils which have demolished things. They just carried on like bulldozers. 
going through the centuries. What has happened still happens and won't be changed. Why? Those in charge are coming from the monastic world. Their igumenoi, the abbots, often become bishops. The bishops have to be of the celibate clergy, therefore they come from monastic life. And therefore they are men of prayer. The men of prayer listen a lot to the Holy Ghost. So it wouldn't cross their minds to fiddle with what has been received from the early church, essentially. The liturgy is greater than man, and man should not be tampering with it as though it were his own possession. It is received and handed on in its integrity. There's an old saying here in Ireland, if it's not broke, don't fix it.